All right, hi everybody. Thank you very much for sticking around. I am talking to you today, as Adam said, about home-growing top-notch developers. Uh, that sounds awesome, right? Yeah. Woo! Well, it is, and not just because I'm trying to keep you awake at 5.15 on a Friday afternoon. But more precisely, I'm going to be talking about coaching and making the case for active coaching within your development teams. But first, a little bit about me so that we can all be friends here. I'm Bob Holt. I work on the open web. I recently joined the team at Boku in Boston. Boku is an open web technology company by and for programmers. We create new open web technologies like Grunt and others you've probably heard of. And we try to help them become viable through consulting, training, coaching, and community development. So com companies come to us to, to work the magic that I'm about to talk to you about for their engineering teams. Uh, so here are some secrets for you. Uh, so B B Boku is a pretty cozy place for me to be, given how strongly I feel about uh, this subject. So I'm guessing when I said coaching, some of you probably had a knee-jerk reaction, uh, like if I had said social media guru, or I want to drill down into leveraging your brand to deliver a greater ROI for your stakeholders. And, and believe me, I really felt the same way when I first started looking at this and heard the word coaching. Um, but then I started trying to figure out how to actually teach people instead of just talk at them about programming. Uh, so there are some solid reasons that we, we, we need to look at coaching as an important part uh, of our complete work life. So a show of hands, how many people in here are actually trying to hire developers right now? Yeah. <laughs> right? So uh, how many are finding it really easy to find them? Okay. <laughs> If you are, send them my way. Um, so the problem we're facing as an industry is that we all want expert developers to, to fill out our teams, but either there aren't enough of them out there or we just can't find them. You know, we're terrible at finding them. So what we need to do is actually hire developers at a lower skill level than we would ideally want and then ramp, ramp them up so that we don't have to turn down paying work. So this isn't necessarily the situation we want to be in, but in making lemonade out of these lemons, uh, if we can hold on to these developers over time, they'll become valuable assets within our organization. And coaching is how we're gonna make that happen. So let's make this clear. Software development is a design practice. Now we as developers probably shoulder a little bit of blame for trying to cheapen the word design to mean something more like making websites pretty. But design really is a process of thinking about the big picture uh, and planning how everything comes together to form a complete whole. So as much as we want to talk about the tech stuff in software like APIs and libraries and algorithms, actually building a product requires a design mentality. And that's why we use terms like you know, software architecture and API design. So I think if we, we think about it like design, then we need to teach it like it was designed. And if we look at architecture and design schools, we find that they're done in a very interesting way. So designers and architects have known for a really long time that design requires this gradual building of competence uh, alongside senior practitioners in a relatively low-risk environment. And that's why design schools are set up as studios with large practicum, practicum component um, and instructors almost working side by side with students to coach them and help them discover the process of design. So in many studios, groups of students are actually as important as the instructors because they, they sometimes take on that coach's role and help each other learn. But this is very different from the way we teach most other subjects, especially at the university level. But this environment is actually really great for building expertise in any subject. But Bob, you say, and let me just, we lost the joke on his shirt. Uh, we don't have time to teach noobs, right? Besides, why can't they go do what I do and like code all night, every night, and learn everything on their own and then not at all be overtired and a dead weight on their team in the morning? Um, RTFM, right? And, and lulls and trophies. <laughs> but this, this is really a, a really, frankly, damaging mindset that has its root cause in one thing. And then it's, we forget everything that we went through when we learned. So 
the idea that we all were completely self-taught and that we got where we are by coding all night, every night, is largely a myth that we tell ourselves. When a new developer asks us for help, we actually forget every little nudge or a little bit of coaching in the workplace or message on Stack Overflow that really helped us you know, make that jump. So what we do is we actually hand them JavaScript, the good parts, and we send them on their way, and we say, learn this. Go code all night. And we get really frustrated when they come back and they can't actually implement prototypal inheritance. So for the most part, doing it this way is a, is a waste of time for everyone involved. Which brings me to this book. Oh, this book. So outliers really popularized this idea that expertise is achieved in 10,000 hours of practicing the same thing over and over and over. But that's really the path to madness. Um, you can't just put in 10,000 hours doing the exact same thing and expect to be awesome at it when you're done. The, the Beatles were actually an example of this 10,000 hour rule. Uh, but when asked about it, Paul McCartney said this. It's not a general rule. Um, if you're gonna be as successful as the Beatles, it takes a little more. And it, actually, a careful reading of Outliers points out that 10,000 hours is a necessary but not sufficient condition for expertise. And we, what we forget is, is that fact, and we do that because it doesn't really make good cocktail party ba banter. Uh, it, it's really only continuing to work on harder and harder problems, working right on the edge of, of our competence where the, the risk is so high for failure and, and trying to do things and sometimes failing that we actually get better. But even if it were efficient for individuals to go off on their own and learn without coaching, what we lose is, is a window into what skills and habits they're actually picking up. You know, the best case scenario is that we leave them to their own devices and it takes them longer to become experts. But it's actually much more likely that they're just gonna work for years and years and years and get stuck at some point, at some median skill level, because nobody took the time to, to coach them and, and push them that extra step. Which brings me to, there's actually a distinct difference between experts and non-experts. And to get them to be one and not the other, we actually need to cultivate that expertise. And this is the most important reason to me to, to actually take an active hand into, in coaching people. It, you, don't, you don't have time to not coach noobs. Because this difference is that experts have so internalized their skills that under most circumstances they don't actually have to think about the solution. And that sounds awesome, um, but it's even more powerful than you can possibly imagine because of this called procedural memory. So back in the 1800s or so, people started talking about this thing called procedural memory. But it really wasn't until the last half of the 20th century that it was really recognized as an integral part of skill acquisition and expertise. So what procedural memory is, is that whenever we humans actually do anything, we store a memory of that in our subconscious. So when we go to repeat the action we've stored in that subconscious, we don't have to think about it. It's applied automatically. And if you think about tying your shoes or signing your name, you know, it's that kind of thing. It, it turns into, you know, when you're doing a physical activity, it turns into muscle memory. Uh, when you're doing a mental activity, it just happens. So over time, we can actually unconsciously reproduce more and more activities. And eventually, people start referring to it as intuition or referring to us as magicians. And we say, yeah, that's absolutely right. Because when you look at average humans, you can actually only keep about four active things going on in your head at, at any one time. But when you have something stored in procedural memory that you just apply, it happens automatically and it doesn't take up one of those precious brain threads. And that lets you devote that to something else. So that something else is more and more complex problems. We're able to look at a problem and actually pattern match away all of that stuff that, that we already know. It eliminates noise like a pair of secret decoder glasses. So we're left with a, a reduced problem to solve, which we can then leverage this, this book learning that we've learned over time against. And the cool thing is that this, is, this happens in all learning. It's not just development, it's not just design. This is what happens when you learn anything well. And the people that we actually call experts have just done a lot of this. 
They have a lot of stored memories, uh, which means that they're actually able to eliminate parter, larger and larger parts of the problem just at a glance. No work, no effort. That frees them up to concentrate the parts of the problem that a, a less expert practitioner wouldn't even be able to get to because they haven't been able to pattern match away the parts that the expert has. And this is why lesser skilled people require you know, simpler problems, more direction, and a lot of help from us. Their repertoire of stored procedures hasn't grown to the point where they can take on more complex problems. But why does coaching teach this better than just what we traditionally think of as teaching? So we think about what it means to teach, the, the process really that comes to mind is just passing knowledge from one person to another. But without reinforcing this knowledge through practice, it's basically useless. Modern schooling since the late 19th and early 20th century has been characterized by this mechanism where we just pass theoretical knowledge from one person to another, despite reams of research that actually show that it doesn't work that well. And it was so ineffective that the National Research Council wrote a book about it, um, which I've already quoted from earlier. And if we think about people who are really studying intelligence and learning, one of the things that comes to mind is artificial intelligence. And researchers in artificial intelligence have learned this lesson like 40 years ago. Because intelligence is really hard to create out of nothing. Because you can't just feed rules and algorithms and logic into a, a computer and have it make good decisions. And when we think about artificial intelligence, that makes a lot of sense to us now. But the problem is that we're still trying to do this to people. Whose kid is that? That's really gross. Uh, he's mine. Uh, but being an expert is, is not just knowing a lot about something. When we pump somebody's head full of facts and rules, what we're feeding them is theoretical declarative knowledge, which, you know, don't get me wrong, that's a really good basis for expertise. You know, this is the knowledge that we actually turn to after we've pattern matched all that stuff away, and we actually have to think about the problem that's left. We start thinking about that stuff we learned in, in theory. And then we have to apply that practically. But that, that theoretical knowledge is the, the what and like the when, but it's not how and why things work. So what we really need is to be able to apply that theoretical knowledge practically against problems. But even worse than the type of knowledge we receive is how we receive it. Everybody's favorite, which you're experiencing right now, uh, is a lecture. Uh, lectures are notoriously awful ways to transfer information. And I think we can all agree on that. Um, they're so terrible, largely because they're based on this idea of pumping people's heads full of knowledge, and then they'll just retain it. And then we hand them a degree and un unleash them on the real world. But if anybody can walk out of a lecture keeping three main points in their head, then that's actually been a really great lecture. So. After lecturing at the university level for over 20 years, uh, psychologist Carl Rogers said this to a group of teachers at Harvard. And this did not go over well. Uh, it would have been worse if he had stopped there, but he goes on to say this, which is that I just want to be a learner, and I want to try to understand the way learning seems and feels to another person. So what is he describing here in 1952? Coaching. In professional, circle, the professional development circles today, we call this coaching. And this is the way people can actually, truly learn. Coaching is a joint exploration of a topic between an instructor and a learner where both are interested in finding out the answer. So in software development, this can be pair programming or whiteboarding sessions or code reviews or preferably all of the above. And some places you know, in our industry do this really well, and that's awesome. But this is, in the majority of workplaces, I'd say the first thing to go when deadline time comes around. So as the instructor who's, who's trying to prioritize all of our commitments, and we're trying to prioritize coaching, or trying to prioritize client deliverables, we, we might lose sight of the benefits of coaching. These benefits like more confident, robust, and collaborative teams. So I'm going to ask you to remember this. And I'm going to pump that up a little bit. Yeah. 
So as I was preparing this presentation, uh, I saw Santiago Ortiz, who was one of the speakers last month at OpenVizConf in Boston. And he tweeted this. So when it goes well, coaching evokes this feeling of like euphoric nostalgia that really is, when people talk about the joy of teaching, that's what it is. As you see someone come to grasp a particularly difficult concept, you have these mirror neurons. And these neurons, when you see somebody do an action you've already done in the past or learn something you've already learned, these things fire off. And it's just like you're experiencing the same thing at the same time. You're transported back to your, your aha moment uh, that you had when you first learned it. And to be able to see this through somebody else's eyes again is, is magical for a, a really touchy-feely word. I mean, it, it's magical. So, you know, I implore you to be selfish you know, don't just do it because it helps your team, but do it because you feel this. You know, it feels good. All right, so how do we coach? People learn in different ways. That's pretty much taken as, as fact. Um, but they also bring different ways of looking at the world into their practice. So one of the best things we can actually do for students or people who are learning or people on our teams is to, to take these past experiences that they've already had and yes, this involves getting to know them um, and apply them in, into development. So what I mean is to take something they understand really well that they picked up somehow in their past and use it as a, as a metaphor and a basis for new learning. Because when we build the metaphors from their experience and knowledge that they already have, it makes taking on new knowledge more concrete. So I'm gonna to refer to Rachel Neighbors who um, had a talk yesterday morning uh, her JavaScript for developers talk. And she actually, you know, I was sitting there hoping to, to actually pull things out for this. Um, and she hit this on the nail on the head. She said that, that so many introductory books to JavaScript assume that the reader is coming from a development background already. The metaphors that they use are based on programming concepts. You know, they, they try to explain prototypes in terms of classes and stuff like that. But Turning Java developers into JavaScript developers is like teaching cats to be dogs. Um, I said that in kind of a less than charitable moment, um, and I don't actually think that. But the point it brings to my mind is, is why are we treating non-developers, people coming from a non-programming background, any differently than we are treating you know, developers from, from some other language? Because I don't, personally, I don't think it's actually any harder to teach anyone coming from any other subject as long as we do it right, as long as we draw metaphors from their past experience and it making that, that correlation concrete. And Rachel used some, some beautiful metaphors yesterday. She said, object prototype is like a genetic blueprint that is transferred but slightly modified uh, by su su succeeding generations of children. And she compared APIs, uh, programming interfaces, to airlocks in a biodome, which happens to be one of the greatest movies of the 90s. No joke. So whoever you're coaching, find a, a metaphor from their past, their personal experience, to help them understand development concepts. And this is going to go a long way to help them understand. The other thing we can do is to, to make things visible to them, make their thinking visible. So whenever we make all these metaphors and we think we're doing great, sometimes it still just doesn't sink in. You know, the, the, whoever's learning a particular topic just doesn't get it. So ask to make their thinking visible. Ask them to reason their solutions out loud, however wrong they may be. Just don't say, wrong, lols. Uh, you know, ask them to reason it out, out loud because you're going to find, you know, through pair programming or whiteboarding or just a conversation where they went wrong. And you can just kind of tease that out and figure out why they went wrong and maybe change your metaphor or apply a new one just to you know, help that small part that you kind of glossed over before be more concrete. And finally, engage both sides of the brain. You know, we typically focus on learning as a process of logical thought and working on the logical portion of our brain, but there's this whole creative side. And I'm gonna pick on another speaker, uh, Jen Schiffer, who earlier this afternoon talked about creative coding um, and if you weren't there, I suggest watching it 
because it was an awesome talk. Um, but really, we need to engage the creative side of our brain, and I think we're uniquely able to do that within software development because we can use both the logical and the creative at the same time through things like creative coding. You know, when we teach programming concepts, we should embrace things like this to help our learners just solidify their understanding. One, it increases their motivation. It gives them projects they want to work on. And two, it engages both sides of their brain. So everybody learns in different ways, but if we can draw from their previous experience, engage both sides of their brain, and be flexible, we can help this practical knowledge stick. So that's kind of an overview of, of learning itself, but actually building expertise. How do we take this kind of theoretical knowledge of how to teach people and, and actually grow expertise? So we saw that experts are experts because they have this wealth of experience from which to draw. You know, it helps them reduce the problem in such a way that they can tackle it better than a non-expert. So what we need to do is actually build this repertoire of solutions through progressive problem solving. To learn, you know, we need, as I mentioned, to be, to be constantly working on the edge of our competence, right at that risky, risky place. Um, and when we're working there, we run into solutions that we don't know the answer to, or problems we don't know the answer to. So Carl Breider and Marlene Scardamalia, uh, I'm not gonna spell it, they'll be in my references, uh, in their book, Surpassing Ourselves, uh, which I highly recommend, it's really the, the best book on this to topic that I've, I've been able to, to find. Um, they define a problem as a goal that we intend to achieve, but we have no idea how we're gonna do it. But then two other researchers, Hubert and Stuart Dreyfus, um, actually, they tell us how we're gonna do it, and it's experimentation. You know, they define an experiment as the actions we take to figure out a problem. And they t go on to talk about it as a way of kind of just teasing out that right solution for a particular situation. So when we think about problem solving, not as just regurgitating answers we already know, but as experimenting with different solutions in this probing, exploratory way, you know, if we, we perform an experiment and we like what the result is, then we've solved our problem. Done. But if for some reason there's part of the solution that we don't like or we don't actually solve our problem, then we try something else. And this, this is how we form experiences in our brain. You know, good or bad, you know, that gets stored in our subconscious and when that's available for us for pattern matching later. So an individual builds their expertise by adding to their procedural repertoires and uh, progressively solving problems on a harder and harder basis. So how do we encourage this within our development teams? Congratulations, you're already here. Um, trainings and conferences are great ways to introduce developers to skills you don't already have in-house. And they, they continue to maintain their value even after you have an expert team because I don't think learning things at trainings and conferences is necessarily the most important part. I think the, the, most, the two most important things you get out of trainings and conferences our inspiration and professional socialization. So I believe that trainings and conferences should be inspirational. There's no way someone's gonna be able to retain everything you learn in a weekend or a day or even a couple of hours. But a, a well-run training or a conference should provide lots of examples of advanced concepts that tease you into kind of exploring that on your own. You know, going out and working on your expertise you know, these things should inspire us and make us want to immediately go start coding. Um, I saw so many tweets after Jen Schiffer's talk about wanting to go, like, people were itching to go, like, creative code or go, like, tell their kids that, yes, we're going to try this again. You know, I'm not going to teach you Python this time. Let's try it in JavaScript. Um, you know, don't pressure your kids. But, um, but that's, that's awesome. And that's what conferences should do. Um, not only that, but great teachers and speakers can become role models of a sort for new developers. You know, I know that the first conference I went to, um, some of the speakers there have been and continue to be probably unconscious role models for me. Some of them are probably in this room. Some of them may even be watching online. So thank you. Now, the other benefit of conferences is professional socialization. And this helps establish and reinforce appropriate behaviors within the community which seems to be something we need to be constantly reminded of. Um, 
it's such an important part of becoming a professional, though, that it was institutionalized hundreds of years ago by the British legal profession. Um, they're called inns of court. So these inns of court actually combine the functions of a, of a bar, like the American Bar Association, uh, and a social club. And they go back to at least the 14th century. So anyone in Britain to this day who wants to join the legal profession has to go through a system of dinners at these inns of court that reinforce the social norms of community. Uh, these dinners also provide opportunities for networking and benchmarking your skills against the industry, as well as coaching uh, and even some emotional support. They're pretty neat. So if we have great external tools and conferences and trainings, what can we do internally in our own teams on our day-to-day -day basis? One thing we need to do is, is create this atmosphere of cooperation. So research from the last 20 years or so seems to show that while competition within a learning environment actually is useful for some learners, this atmosphere of cooperation is generally superior for group learning. And in a cooperative atmosphere, individuals are encouraged to, to contribute their ideas and their thoughts and their particular strengths to the community, which allows lots of people to work on their expertise at the same time, you know, constantly changing roles between learner and coach and back and forth. Um, this book, How People Learn, describes bad classroom situations where this unwritten rule just pervades. It's, you know, this never get caught making a mistake, uh, don't get caught not knowing an answer, or a library, or something. So this norm actually keeps people from asking questions when they don't understand material. Uh, it, it keeps them from actually experimenting and trying new things and trying new questions and hypotheses. When they interviewed a lot of professionals in the UK, these professionals stress the point that there's, there's really no difference in the professional environment. When you work in a situation where it's easy to ask questions without being embarrassed, it's a considerable benefit to your you know, mental life, much, you know, not to mention your learning. So we want people in teams and at conferences to ask questions when they don't understand things. We want people to try new things, even if we've already proven that it's bad because it's helping them to learn and prove out these new hypotheses. But unfortunately, the reality of business is that there are very few opportunities for someone to just sit there and learn and fail. Um, more importantly, there's an understandable reluctance to let a novice run wild on project work when there's money involved. But we need to find ways to give people the ability to fail. And this is why some places offer things like shadowing opportunities or internships or personal project time. This ability to, to experiment and try new things is integral to skill development. It makes us better developers. That's a soapbox, and I'm about to get on it. So this cooperative environment's not just for our development teams. It extends into conferences and trainings and your interactions on Twitter and GitHub. Wherever we meet other developers, um, it's a key part of professional socialization. So these places are our ends of court. They should be reinforcing industry norms of diversity and acceptance and a welcoming, cooperative environment. But whether we intend to or not, a lot of times we're not as welcoming to people we perceive as outsiders as we should be. You know, and I'm not necessarily talking about issues of gender or race or things that we obviously continue to struggle with as an industry. I'm talking about just being friendly to strangers. You know, and I understand, like, a lot of this is unconscious. You know, we're shy or nervous or tired or hungover, and we, we don't make an effort to say hi to people around us that we don't know. But worse than that, sometimes we look at someone and immediately decide whether they're one of us or not. Are they a good developer or a bad developer? Are they worth my time or not? Or maybe we actually even hide behind the shrubbery of semi-anonymity on the internet and just straight up be mean to people. But I, I know for most of us, like this segregating people into one of us and not is a really unconscious behavior. Uh, we don't realize that we're actually making someone feel unwelcome. But this is me making it a conscious thing because this crap needs to stop. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm actually getting a little emotional. Um, I'm really tired of, of hearing that people don't feel comfortable at conferences or have their work <clears throat> torn apart on Twitter or they, they really don't feel like someone 
that they wanted to approach you and talk about work was approachable. <clears throat> Everyone here is a developer, um, no matter their skill level, and they wouldn't be here if they weren't. <clears throat> but on the other side, if you're, you're personally not feeling welcomed, please know that as a general rule, you are. You know, from my experience, people at development conferences are just as scared of you as you are of them. I mean, I, I'm, I'm living proof. I have gone to so many conferences and not spoken to one person. So let's just all try to be more open to meeting each other and figuring out what we have in common. You know, try it after this session. Try it going into the, the ending session. Just stick out your hand, introduce yourself, figure out what you have in common. And if the other person is still mean to you, then that person sucks. But go find someone else who's not gonna be mean to you. You know, find somebody who wants to be your friend. Yeah, I'll be your friend. Um, it's something we all need to work on, me too. All right, off the soapbox. So when you come down to it, coaching isn't really anything groundbreaking. It's one-on-one -on -one interaction with other developers to jointly try out a bunch of different stuff until you figure out a problem. It's, it's being in an environment that allows the free exchange of ideas, and that's what community is all about. So if coaching is creating this atmosphere and working on it, who is the coach? Everyone. <laughs> Seriously, everyone in the organization knows something else. Someone doesn't. <laughs> Man, I love it. Um, if we've relaxed the environment to the point where we can all drop our egos and just ask questions to anyone at any time and ask for help and offer help, then we can turn any problem into a learning situation for both the coach and the learner. So I'm going to leave you with one example of, of how this really worked for a team that I, I was partially responsible for managing. This wasn't even my idea. So the team I was on had a weekly-ish, hour-long JavaScript class that was intended to teach what were formerly strictly HTML and CSS developers about JavaScript, bring them up to speed, turn them into JavaScript developers. So we devoted yet another session to prototypal inheritance. But this time, we had an exercise prepared for everyone to build a constructor that created a pop-up modal, and then build constructors that extended that base object to create a video modal, an image modal, and a form modal. Nothing, not a big deal. But it expresses the concept of prototypal inheritance, but it's also similar to what we'd actually do on a client project. So the team, you know, we told them, this is your downtime project. You know, when you roll off client work and you have nothing to do, work on this. If you get bored at home and you don't watch TV, I guess, then, you know, work on this. Take as long as you need. Use whatever resources you want. You know, ask for help. Ask for suggestions. Talk to me. Talk to the other instructor. Um, and then as everybody finishes this project, we're going to sit down and code review it one by one. This worked like a charm. So not only were they excited to do this, they were excited to see how everybody else did it. So it, it was like little buzzing bees in the office for a couple of weeks. And you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, they, they seemed to complete it in the order of their parent, current level of expertise, which is cool because that meant that the more confident team members, the, the more skilled or experienced people, they had their stuff code reviewed first. And then that eased the way for the, the less confident members to, to see that code reviews aren't aren't that big of a deal. Um, they're not so bad. But then, because that, the more experienced developers were freed up, that allowed them to spend more time helping the, the less experienced developers. And it's kind of this constantly like nuclear chain reaction going on. So in five or 10 minutes here or there, when we would actually like gather around somebody's desk and talk about how you know, this developer approached it and that developer approached it and what are the differences and you know, what bugs are you gonna run into because you did that, that, those are the most memorable experiences of my time there. And, and I was a teacher. I wasn't learning, but I was learning. Um, it was awesome. And also not my idea, again. So what am I suggesting here? I propose a school for gifted youngsters. <laughs> well, not really, um, but, but sort of, but, but not really. 
Um, the harsh reality is that the universities on a whole aren't doing this for us. Uh, it's up to us to set up our teams as a design practice. You know, we need to integrate structured coaching into our daily process. The coach doesn't need to be an expert teacher, but the coach needs to be an expert learner who's willing to experiment alongside you know, the person who's being trained. The coach needs to be someone who's just as interested in learning, if not more so than the student. So before I wrap up, I'm going to give you a mission. Uh, one for if you're individuals, and one if you're looking for to build teams. So first, for individual developers, don't be a hero. Uh, there are a bunch of developers out there, and perhaps more in this industry than others, who are trying to do this all on their own. You have no expert community that you're part of on a daily basis to help you grow. But you have the discipline to sit down and force yourself to, to climb this ladder of expertise alone. And I'd venture to suggest that at some point in our careers, we all were there. We were all doing that at some point. Because most development jobs, when you first get them, require some level of knowledge, and how else are you going to get it? But don't be a hero. Find a good group of like-minded people. Find people here. Find people in your workplace. Find people at meetups or hackathons or somewhere else, and unite with them. Um, Donald Schoen who I believe was at MIT, um, said this, you know, you have the advantage of freedom, but you're reinventing the wheel. You're not getting the accumulated experience of people who could be helping you right now. So, you know, find people. Uh, you're going to grow much faster than you would alone. And finally, if you're, you're trying to build a development team, uh, the difference between experts and non-experts uh, is this practical repository of knowledge. So the reason it's developed is comes down to opportunity and motivation. So if we focus on opportunity uh, and through coaching, there's still a lot we can't do about motivation. So this is why I advocate for hiring for passion more than uh, anything else almost. If someone's truly passionate about a subject, they're going to have the drive to focus uh, and, and become expert. You know, if we put the effort into coaching them, they'll become the great developers of tomorrow. Uh, this is something that we're actually putting into practice at Boku. We've opened up this engineering fellow position where we're looking to hire passionate people who don't necessarily have the JavaScript skills yet to become you know, a full-fledged engineer. We're going to put them through a month of training, a month of working on internal projects with coaching, and a month of shadowing client work uh, with a, another full-time developer with the hope that at the end of that, really putting this coaching into practice that we're going to have them as Boku quality open web engineers. So you know, check back with me in a few months and see if everything I said here today is, is true. So becoming an expert at something is, is a long process that requires progressive problem solving at the edge of one's competence. You know, we can help this out by having teams that create a cooperative atmosphere where failure is an option and the learner is guided to discover how software design as a whole actually works. If we follow the model of the design studio and work as coaches, it's going to be beneficial to everyone, coaches and learners alike. And if you're trying to improve your craft, but you're not being challenged in your current environment, or you're not in a cooperative environment, then make a change. Um, you know, whether it's in your work or your personal life, find somewhere that's going to give you what you need to build your expertise. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Holt. I have a bunch of references for you, and you can peruse them at your leisure at these addresses. Any questions for Bob? Oh, here we go. Uh, what can you do to be coachable and make coaching an enjoyable experience? Um, so to, to be coachable, I think asking that question is a, is a great <laughs> example that you probably are. Um, you know, there's a lot of research into you know, IQ and people being smart, but you know, it really comes down to motivation. And if you have that motivation and you want to learn, then find someone who will fill that gap for you, who will, who will be that coach. And yeah, um, they're out there. They're in every city, every town. 
Um, you know, I, I've had people ask me, you know, I live in this city, what are some places there that are doing, you know, the good work? And, you know, find somebody, the best thing I can say is go to meetups, and that's where you're going to find, you know, examples of people who are doing the great work, people who are, you know, hiring, because they're always looking for people. Um, but even just strike up conversation and say, look, I'm, I'm trying to learn this. You know, what can, is there something you can do to help me? Can you point me to resources? Things like that. Um, I wish I would save it every time I send it, but I have an email that's about this long of people to follow on Twitter, meetups to go to in Boston, and books to read. Um, and, you know, following those people, interacting with the community is really how you find coaches. The videos are going to be online, hopefully starting next week, uh, which is faster than usual for us. Um, but we're aiming for that. And you'll be able to relive the magic ad nauseum, which sounds like a threat, I guess. <laughs> Anything else? I mean, I'd say take baby steps. So where we did the prototypal inheritance exercise, um, you know, we took an hour a week. And man, I would hope in a startup that's not a, too much time. Um, if it is, come see me afterwards. <laughs> um, I mean, an hour a week is not a terrible amount of time. And if you can start there and, you know, just come together as a group and, you know, Kibitz and, and talk about you know what you're working on. Um, just start creating that environment where you are, and then try to grow it um, because the benefits will start to make themselves apparent. And then that's how you can kind of point to management that you know it's a good idea. And if we run out of time, you can certainly come up and talk to me. Yeah, I actually thought about this a lot because my, my last position um, was a really distributed team. Uh, we had members in India, in London, New York, in Boston. Um, and I, I, I was really just starting to, to kind of put together thoughts about that. Um, IRC. Yeah, I mean, there's IRC, but, but I, I feel like you need, like, you still need that face to face. So, like, Skype or Google Hangouts or something. Something that you can actually do code reviews and like get to know the other people on your team. Um, I mean, so much of this actually comes down to relationships, whether it's on your development team, you know, even if it's distributed or it's here at a conference. You know, build those relationships, and that's going to build the community. Well, let's give. Bo oh wait, what? Go ahead. Oh, go. So I'm not exactly sure what you mean by, by fostering of innovation. Um, that sounds like social media guru to me. But um, no, I mean, I, I think it would roughly be the same process, right? So part of fostering expertise is ex, you know, encouraging ex experimentation. And there's, I don't think there's innovation without experimentation uh, and risk taking. So you know, if that's what we're using to, to teach people, then that's going to spur innovation. All right, now let's give Bob the last round of applause. Thank you, everybody.